First, welcome to our annual forecast dinner. Um, this is our 12th annual event, the 2016 forecasting event. And we're very fortunate to have the support of our sponsors. So I think that 2016 has started out um, by shocking us a little bit and telling us a little bit that uh, the issues we're going to talk about tonight with geopolitics are very important. Um, we all thought that the Fed was going to help us return to normal, um, and I don't think anybody has really enjoyed what normal feels like. Um, I think that everybody wants uh, Janet to uh, bring back the punch bowl, and today she didn't really do that for us. I think that Willis Sparks will have the answers for us and uh, we'll be able to leave tonight knowing how to handle the rest of 2016. And we're gonna try to have our event earlier so that there won't be so much confusion as we get into the stock year. So I think that uh, if we hold it on January 2nd or 3rd, the markets won't have time to, uh, to do what they did. I'd like to thank our sponsors. Our diamond sponsor, Voya, has continued to be uh, our main sponsor, and we appreciate that. T. Rowe has increased their sponsorship and is now a platinum sponsor, and we appreciate that. BlackRock has increased and become a gold sponsor, and I really appreciate BlackRock's contribution. Uh, all of our silver sponsors, Allianz, Deutsche Management, Hartford Funds, Invesco Pro Shares, Janus Capital, Montag and Caldwell, Parametric, State Street Global Advisors, Willis Towers Watson, and Vanguard. Thank you personally for making this event and making our society as successful as it is. Without the sponsors, it, a lot of our activities would not be possible. I'd also like to thank all the volunteers who helped make this evening possible, uh, in particular uh, John Skinner, our VP of Programs, and Kathy Ford, but a lot of people went a long way to uh, put this together for us, and I think it's really important that we recognize them. Um, all of us are trying to help our clients invest with excellence, and I think that for the society, these events are a great chance for us to get together and share ideas, but also a great chance for us to, uh, to thank those who make a difference in the society. Um, this year has been a particularly busy year for the society. In September, we formed the ASFIP Foundation, and so far we have raised uh, over $100,000. Our mission is to educate students and improve financial literacy in the Atlanta community. And our tagline is to learn, grow, and succeed. I think that the foundation has created a vehicle for members to get, step out and get involved in the community, and also an opportunity for other members to give back to the communities that we work and uh, succeed in. I'd especially like to thank LaShonda Fusilier, who coordinates our outreach efforts. Um, we're doing an event on April 28th with Junior Achievement, and I'd like people to check it out and join us there if they can. Um, I'm gonna welcome President George Chen of the Foundation and David Martin, the Executive Director of the Georgia Council on Economic Education. We're gonna make our first grant, and we plan on making grants at our forecast dinner and annual dinner uh, every year going forward. So, we're very, we're very happy to present the Georgia Council on Economic Education check for $5,000 for all the work they do with the stock market game and other efforts. Thank you. We hope you, uh, we want to continue to make a difference. Next up is going to be John Skinner. John is um, 
our VP of programs, and he's done an excellent job in laying out the programs, but also in uh, getting involved with putting all of our activities on YouTube and also uh, making all of our events qualify for continuing aid credit. John is the person who makes things happen in the society, and I think uh, he deserves a great round of applause. Have a great night, everyone. All right, so this year I get the fun job of announcing the winners of our forecasting contest. Uh, so the way this works is at the end of every year, we poll our membership and we try to get the forecast values for the year end. Um, so as you can see, what happens here, like for example, with the S&P 500, uh, at the end of 2014, we, we were closed at uh, 2058 and our member forecast average was 2130. That's really pretty good, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So, but uh, who was the closest we have? Wesley Reagan. Wesley Reagan, congratulations. Um, it's a nice round number. So Wesley wins a $100 gift certificate to Buckhead Life Restaurant Group. Uh, where do we see it going next year? We've got a forecast average of 21.52. It really was pretty modest at the time. Uh, all right, so this is the 10-year treasury. Uh, our, we have three winners here. That's Tom Martin, LaShonda Fusilier, and George Chen. Splitting that, uh, they'll each get a $50 gift card to Buckhead Life Restaurant Group. <laughs> Next up, we have a very interesting one. We have the WTI. Uh, so really, you couldn't have called us very bullish, really, on the WTI, but you still had to be an outlier to win this one. Who was our outlier? Alex Hertz. <laughs> Alex, I can only hope that you were invested accordingly. Uh, this is a food for thought. We have no members who have forecast a value below 35. Uh, on the Euro, we again have three winners, Elena Vasilescu, David Summers, and David Fisher, all at $1.08. And, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and our forecast average is $1.05, forecasting a little further, further weakening there. Our gold spot winner is Rob Spencer, 1,074. And this year, we decided not to ask our membership for the gold forecast. Instead, we thought we'd ask them for the Fed funds rate. So we got back a wide range of responses. We've got anywhere from negative 25 basis points to positive 150. So this would be an interesting one to watch. So I want to take this time to invite anyone who is in the audience today not already a member to feel free to join. Uh, you don't have to be a CFA charter holder. Oh, we do ask that you be friendly to them. <laughs> uh, it's $100 a year, and with that, you get admission to two of our lunch events. You get uh, some social events throughout the year, and also member pricing on the rest of them. So th this is just a snapshot of our upcoming events in February. I thought the infrastructure being so intertwined with geopolitics would make a good follow-up to this event. That's going to be next Thursday uh, for lunch at 103 West. We have Francis Graywitt, who's a portfolio manager on the Deutsche Global Infrastructure Fund. Uh, that Saturday, we have what our version is of March Madness. We have uh, schools from Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina all competing for the best investment research presentation. Uh, this year, our subject company is Intercontinental Exchange, ICE, and that'll be in Alpharetta. And actually, this year, we have a, uh, a networking event following that at the Five Seasons Brewery. Uh, that'll be uh, right after, that'll be probably about 4 o'clock. And uh, finally, uh, Wednesday, February 24th, uh, presentation is entitled Stupid, Lazy, and Rich. It's on behavioral finance featuring Dr. Daniel Crosby. It should be a very, very interesting one. Um, the behavioral finance and the infrastructure events are both approved for CFP and IMCA continuing education credit. I just wanted to mention that because that's a, a new initiative of our society as part of our broader outreach to the greater Atlanta financial community. In May, we'll have our Future of Finance events. 
Um, and I think it's really important for us sometimes to take a step back, uh, kind of think about collaborating as an industry. We spend so much of our time, our working hours as competitors, and I think it's good for us to take a step back, think about how we can collaborate to make sure that the financial industry really is in support of the greater good and, to, and supporting society and improving investor outcomes. And so all of our events in May will focus on these themes that you see here, these six themes. So I think that's probably about it for me. I wanna thank all of our forecast sponsors. We have, uh, I think that all of our sponsors have really shown a dedication, not just to putting their name up here as logos, but also just fostering a collaborative environment and a vibrant financial community. So I wanna thank you. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Christine Hertzellers. Um, Christine Hertzellers is representing Voya, uh, who is our diamond sponsor this year. Christine is the Chief Investment Officer of Fixed Income at Voya. She leads a team of over 100 investment professionals and over $125 billion in fixed income assets. She's a member of the U.S. Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee, and she joined Voya in 2004, prior experience at Freddie Mac, Alliance Capital, and Bank One. Good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm honored to get a chance to frame our upcoming speaker, because uh, you know certainly the forecasting dinner is a cornerstone event for our Atlanta society. And, and certainly just the networking opportunity and the connectivity that we can develop as well as increase brand awareness of, as a really thoughtful, thought-leading investment community is key. And so, you know, certainly, you know, as you look at it, the world is flat, right? And there have been currency wars and correlations are increasing. And so really thinking about the world, not just the U.S. economy, is key in terms of investment success uh, for our franchises and for our clients. And so, you know, certainly I would say that, you know, top of mind, you know, the start of 2016 has been really rocky, right? And so, you know, despite the Fed being a little bit more dovish, even today, equities continue to struggle. So, you know, what, what's really growing, going on? I mean, certainly correlations are growing. Understanding the global environment is key. And many investors, we're asking ourselves now, is the U.S. strong enough to get beyond all of these global forces. So are we looking at sort of a 1998 Thai bot crisis where you know, the global environment created a sell-off in risk assets, but the US was strong enough and isolated enough to go forward? And I would say generally that is the consensus view still in the market, uh, you know, that we're gonna have a stronger second half and that we can weather the storm, as Janet Yellen herself said. But you know, cracks are forming in the mortar. It's getting darker. You know, technicals are very bearish. And so I think for us as investors, understanding the global environment and how much it's going to create continued anxiety in the U.S. is critical. So, as well as geopolitical risk, obviously, is a very important in terms of our overall macro investment thesis as investors. So what are some of those geopolitical risks that I'm thinking of? And I'm sure many of you are thinking of, you know, today in the room. Well, let's start with the U.S. today. My gosh, I mean, we just got the elections. Uh, the election results, how surprising that, uh, you, know, we, you know, totally non, kind of what you call consensus or normal candidates are now leading, or at least out of the gates leading both parties. So that's certainly something. And I think the sentiment in the U.S., I saw a quote by John Stewart, is, is if the con is the opposite of pro, then isn't Congress the opposite of progress? <laughs> and... Right? I mean, and we're seeing that in terms of what the U.S. electorate is saying about their lack of confidence in Congress. So can't wait to hear, Willis, our speaker's views on, on U.S. politics, tax reform, and what that mean, might mean for us as investors longer term. You know, second, I mean, certainly Europe, right? We were all thinking in the developed markets that Europe was sort of steady growth. Uh, it was actually one of the bright spots in the world, and yet we're starting to see problems there. Germany's slowing down, Deutsche Bank, 
a little bit of a run on Deutsche Bank, right? We've seen, you know, creating sort of, oh, here we go again, stress in the financial sector, uh, you know, at a time when, uh, you know, most unwelcome, given everything else going on. So that's certainly their Brexit, potentially, you know, all the influx of immigration and the stresses in the Euro community, and what does that really mean, particularly if the economy starts to slow down, given the influx of migrants that they've had. So a lot going on there. I mean, certainly China. I mean, what is going on in China? Like Xi and all these things that he's done as far as are these policy errors? Do they really have control over sort of taking their economy from a commodity-based to a consumer-based economy? What are they doing as far as fighting over islands? You know, South Sea, do they want to get on the global scene? What does that mean with Japan? I mean, certainly China's there. And, you know, right, we're all like fixated over the weekend about reserves and re reserve depreciation, you know, with FX reserves, uh, which was released this weekend. So, you know, China's got some issues. It's got a war chest still, but it's a shrinking war chest. And, and how are they going to really navigate the fact that they have a lot of pressure in terms of capital outflows in their currency? So that's certainly something. And then also, finally, just EM and generally, oil and what it means for Putin, what it means for Saudi Arabia, Iran, you know, the balance of power in the Middle East. I mean, these are profound things to think about, you know, for our society and for the world, because it doesn't appear that oil is gonna rebound magically anytime soon. So when I think about this, and we could go on and on, but the most important thing is what does our speaker, our expert, think about geopolitical risk and how it might inform us as we navigate through this very volatile and very tough year and protect our clients' portfolios. So I am extraordinarily excited about this event, about our speaker, and so I just want to give him a quick intro and, and turn it over to him and let him tell us some of his thoughts on these wide-ranging topics. So Willis works with the Eurasia Group, which is really the, the leading political and, and research company in terms of consulting around geopolitical risk. And so, uh, Mr. Willis focuses on top geopolitical risks as well as U.S. politics and the elections and certainly works on a variety of macro political risk projects for Eurasia. So he is a thought leader in terms of issues, trends, opportunities, and risks associated with the political developments in many of the major economies, including emerging markets. Uh, he uh, joined the Eurasia Group in 2005. He's worked on the Council of Foreign Relations and he's a highly educated person. I could go on and on about all of his degrees, uh, but uh, he's phenomenal. He has an MA in International Affairs from Columbia, just to mention one of the many uh, things that he has done in terms of really understanding uh, what he's gonna talk to us about today. So I'm very excited. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Hello, can everybody hear me? I don't, I don't like podiums very much, so I have a lavalier mic. I'm going to stand in front of the podium. I also don't like PowerPoint uh, or, or name tags. Uh, I do like Coca-Cola. And I like my mom very much. Let me tell you why I start with that. Um, I do work for a company called Eurasia Group. I'm based in New York. I've lived in New York for 30 years. I live in Brooklyn, actually, my wife and I. But I'm from here. I went to high school at Pace Academy about a mile and a half from here. And uh, whenever I speak in Atlanta, I invite my mom to come. And we have an understanding that she's going to sit in the back so that I'm not aware of her. I don't know how it happened. But in this case, my mom is sitting, well, here. And I can already see that this is going to be a problem. It's not her fault. This is just where we ended up. So, hi, Mom. I'm going to try and look over her while I talk. OK, don't look at me. Yeah. So yes, I'm here to talk about geopolitical risk. I'm going to talk about oil prices. I'm going to talk about China. I'm going to talk about Europe. I'm going to talk about the Middle East. But I think I want to begin by just having us all take a moment to reflect how lucky we are that we live in the United States of America, 
I don't know how many people stayed up to watch the speeches last night after the New Hampshire primary, but you know, we can't lose because either Donald Trump is going to be elected president and we're just gonna win and win and win some more, or Bernie Sanders is gonna be elected president and no one will ever pay for college again. So this is the place to be, clearly. Um, I will talk a little bit about the election slightly more seriously than that after I'm done with the rest of, uh, of the world. And I'm going to leave time for questions, so I hope to leave a good 15 minutes for questions. have no idea how that's going to work. If there's a roving microphone, we'll figure that out. Uh, we'll figure that out later. So first, let me explain Eurasia Group and my role there, because it'll give context to what you're going to hear from me, because I'm not an economist. I'm not a financial analyst. I don't do exactly what you guys do. In fact, I don't at all. Um, I'm an analyst of geopolitical risk. And most of the people who work at Eurasia Group, we have about 70 analysts, have a particular country or a particular region or a particular subject that they focus on and they're expert in. I am like my boss, Ian Bremmer, whose book I think a lot of you have at your tables, his book, Superpower. I'm a global macro analyst, which means I'm the person who talks to our clients, who does presentations like this one, occasionally does media, in which I do it around the world. That's what you're going to hear me do now. So it's going to be very broad. Um, I invite questions on anything that I'm going to talk about or anything that you would like for me to talk about. One thing that I'm probably am not going to spend a lot of time up front on is emerging markets. Um, but I certainly invite you to ask me about emerging markets in general or specific markets that you're interested in. But let's start with the price of oil. You can't get much more global than that. Everybody's got an interest in the price of oil. All our clients want to know where oil is going. So we're, low, we're lower for longer. And I mean, the, the, the basic story here is that we live in a world in which now we are chin deep in crude oil. That's the story. Yes, demand has slowed down. China's economy is slowing. There's less oil demand. Although, you know, oil demand continues to grow, but at a slower pace. The real story is supply. And our view at Eurasia Group, I'll just cut straight to the chase for those who are hoping to win the contest next year on oil prices. Our view is that you will see some rebound in oil prices over the course of this year. I think Brent was around $31 a barrel today. So we're looking at more in the $40 to $45 a barrel range on average over 2016. And maybe it drifts toward $50 to $55 a barrel in 2017. Why do we think it will drift higher? Because there is going to be less production uh, in the United States, there is going to be a slowdown in U.S. production in response to the lower price. And also because while growth is slowing in China, there's the, there is a likely possibility that later in the year, people will realize that while China is slowing down, it is not slowing down as fast as a lot of people are afraid that it is. I'll talk more about China in a moment. So we're liable to see prices drift higher. $40, $45 a barrel, maybe a little higher next year. But there is no way, unless there is a bolt from the blue, that we are going back to a world of $115 per barrel, which we saw just in 2014. Now, there are a few reasons for this. Number one, I say we're chin deep in oil. Obviously, the US is producing more oil than ever. Iran is out from under sanctions. Iran is going to be producing four to 500,000 barrels per day additional by the middle of this year. Maybe as much as a million barrels per day more than they're producing now by the end of this year. Iraq is producing more oil. ISIS is no threat to oil production in most, most of the oil production in Iraq, which is taking place in the south of the country to an area where ISIS really has no access. We're even expecting Libya to produce more oil. They'll put together a unity government. It may not last long. Libya will produce more oil. But here's another key factor in why oil prices are not going to go very much higher than I'm talking about. And that is the fact that US production today is governed in large part by a lot of smaller oil companies that are now better able than they've ever been to turn off production and to turn back on production very quickly. These decisions, these changes in oil production happen much more quickly in this country than they used to, which means as the oil price drifts further north toward $40, $45, if it gets into the 50s, 
then more production will come back online pretty quickly in the U.S. to take advantage of the higher price. The Saudis know this. I've been doing speeches like this for more than a decade now, and it used to be that when we talked about oil prices, the question was always, when are the Saudis going to cut? OPEC will get together in Vienna, they'll have a meeting, all the OPEC countries will agree to cut, everybody else except Saudi Arabia will cheat, they'll say they're going to cut and they won't, but the Saudis will cut, markets will respond to that signal. The Saudis do not have that option in 2016. Why? Because they know that if they cut in a world where the U.S. can quickly ramp up production, Iran is producing more, Iraq is producing more, demand is slowing, if the Saudis cut, they know very well that what they're really cutting is their own market share. They're not really adding meaningful upward pressure on the price because more supply will come online and at the end of the day the Saudis will have lost market share and they cannot afford to do that. Not in a world in which their major regional rival Iran is producing oil and the balance of power is shifting in the Middle East as a result. So you are going to read in the newspaper comments where Saudi oil minister, Iran oil minister, Russian government officials are talking about getting together and coordinating on a cut. Number one, that's not going to happen. Number two, even if they announce that they're going to do it, it's not going to happen because these three governments really don't trust each other and none of them is interested in losing their market share in a world where they are all concerned about their own individual economic futures. So this is the world of oil. Now, Looking around the world beyond, you know, beyond the Middle East, what this means is that a lot of the work that we're doing this year at Eurasia Group is helping our clients understand market by market, producers and consumers, how are they responding to the lower oil price? So there's a lot of people who are saying, boy, Russia's in real trouble. Russia's in real trouble. Over the longer term, yes, Russia is in real trouble. But for now, Russia probably has what it needs to weather lower oil prices, at least for 2016. In large part because President Putin has an 82% approval rating. He doesn't really have to worry about a challenge on the streets. There is no alternative party waiting to take advantage of political weakness in government in Russia. They still have plenty of reserves. The ruble is floating, which allows them to absorb some of the damage from the higher price, etc. Make no mistake, over time the Russians are going to have trouble, but probably not so much in 2016. The Saudis, who I'm going to talk about later in more depth, the Saudis also have $600 billion plus in reserves. They're okay for now, but they're also planning for a long-term future. The one country in the world that is a major energy producer that has really got to be worried about where 2016 is going is Venezuela, which was already a basket case before 2016 even got started. Venezuela, uh, Nicola Maduro is now facing uh, a Congress that is dominated by the opposition. And really, Venezuela imports virtually everything except crude oil. So Venezuela is the one country in the world that may have serious problems. We also are trying to help our clients look at consumers of oil and to see which countries are making the most effective adjustments in government policy in response to the lower oil price. There are countries that are taking advantage of the lower oil price to cut subsidies for gasoline, for diesel, for electricity, for other things, knowing that now is a great time to do that because they're passing on less pain and taking less political risk by cutting subsidies now when there's already relief at the pump for a lot of people. That's happening in a lot of emerging market countries as well. So that's the oil situation. And frankly, in terms of it moving equity markets, because I turn on, you know, what, I turn on the television and I look at Bloomberg or CNBC or whatever it is, and I hear, well, equity markets went lower today in response to the lower oil price. And I'm thinking, that correlation doesn't entirely make sense to me. 
It doesn't make sense that equity markets should automatically drop with a lower oil price because, yeah, okay, ExxonMobil is not happy when the oil price is low, but it's pretty good for Delta Airlines, right? So the reason why this is moving equity markets, the reason why oil prices are creating volatility is because we all know this is the most important commodity market in the world. We're all affected by it, and we know that we don't have the same equilibrium price that we had even a year ago, and no one is quite sure where that equilibrium price is. And when there is uncertainty, this is a theme I'm going to return to, when there's uncertainty, as you guys know better than I do, people sell, they stand on the sidelines, they wait until they figure out what the equilibrium price is, and then they jump back in. I think that's the real relationship right now between oil and equities. The second story I want to tell, which is also clearly having an impact on equity markets, is China. So let me start with what's actually going on in China. Our view is that the risk of a hard landing of the Chinese economy, by which I mean a slowdown that is so abrupt and so severe that it actually creates social instability and a sense of crisis inside China. That's not going to happen in 2016 because the Chinese have plenty of reserves. If they need to spend the money to stimulate the economy, they can and they will in an emergency. They don't want to do that. They want to continue with financial market reform. But the Chinese have the cash, if they need to stimulate, that they can. They have the political will. Xi Jinping, the president, has the political control. So hard landing is probably a very overrated threat. But this year really began with a meltdown in the Shanghai stock market and a cascade of responses in, across Asia, in European markets, on Wall Street. Everybody came down with the Shanghai market because we've all learned now two important things about the world that are actually pretty scary and a source of a lot of volatility. One, no one in this room, no one on this planet has ever lived in a world in which the largest economy in the world by GDP which China will soon be, the largest economy in the world is a poor country, a developing country, a potentially politically unstable country, an authoritarian country, a country where very important political and economic decisions are made behind closed doors. We're headed for a world in which the largest economy by GDP is an economy where we don't trust headline government statistics, which is a scary proposition for a lot of people. This is happening at a time when China is actually expanding its international influence. The One Belt, One Road project, the Silk Road project are just getting underway. China's footprint is becoming more important around the world. China is a player in terms of, of trade and investment in every single region of the world. So we know that this country is becoming more important. We are becoming more dependent on growth in that country at a time when we are becoming more aware than ever that we don't really know what's going on there. Of course, it's a source of volatility. Now, that's why when the Shanghai market melts down, you see a cascade effect in other markets. It's not because the Shanghai market tells us anything substantial about China's real economy. It doesn't. This is a market where the state moves huge amounts of money into the market. They change investment rules by the week. They make it easier to move large amounts of money into the market. They make it very difficult to move that money out of the market. It's a manipulated market. Very few Chinese consumers actually have money in that market, and very few foreigners have assumed risk in that market. It's not really connected to anything. It's a casino, and when it melts down, it melts down because it's an immature market, not because, oh my gosh, China is slowing down faster than we thought. But people are still coming to grips with this. Now, it doesn't help that when we're talking about an economy that is becoming more and more important and a financial system that is becoming more and more important in the world, it appears at times like the Chinese leadership really does not know what it's doing. So in response to the meltdown in the Shanghai market, the state announces, well, we're going to impose circuit breakers. This is a great idea, right? This is going to stem the panic. 
Market goes down 7%. We just turn off all the lights. Everybody goes home and the panic is over. And they tried that for about three days. And what they discovered was anytime the market got down 2.5%, everybody sells. Because everybody wants to get out before the lights turn out and they're left without a chair wandering around in the dark. So the, the state realized literally after three or four days, this was a terrible idea. And they took the circuit breakers away. And the rest of the world is looking at the Chinese leadership going, come on, you've got to be better at this. We need you to get this right. We need China to be stable. We need China to grow. And I say we, I mean countries around the world that are depending on China as an engine of growth in the global economy and as a force for stability. So in that sense, China is going to continue to be a source of volatility throughout the year. Now, there is another factor that is exacerbating the uncertainty about China and the volatility, and that is this. President Xi Jinping has reached a point in the reform process in the financial sector, but in the broader economic reform process, where he needs to make sure that everyone within the leadership is on board with the reform. So over the last two years, the one of the ways that he has done that, the most important way in some ways, is he has begun an anti-corruption campaign. The anti-corruption campaign is partly designed to clean up corruption. It's partly designed to restore the Communist Party's image with ordinary people who think the party is very corrupt. But part of it is also about Xi Jinping trying to make sure that everybody is aligned with his goals. This is Xi Jinping's way of saying to the leadership, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move some people out of the leadership. We're going to expel some people from the Chinese Communist Party, and some people are going to jail. But I'm sure it doesn't apply to you because you're all on board with the reform process, right? It's been going on for two years. And in 2016, it's going to get worse. Because next year, and this is the underreported part in the Western media, Next year in China, 2017, is a very important year of political transition in that country. China is not Russia. It's not ruled by one person. It's ruled by seven people. The Standing Committee of the Politburo, it's not much of an overstatement to say, the Standing Committee of the Politburo made up of seven people. They are the core of the leadership. And next year, five of the seven members are going to be replaced. The only people in the Chinese leader in the standing committee who will not be replaced are President Xi and Premier Li. The other five are going to be new people. Clearly, Xi Jinping has an interest in making sure that his people occupy those five seats. He has an interest beyond the standing committee in the Politburo more broadly in making sure that he's got his people aligned with his goals. And for the people that are not aligned with his faction, they understand the risks that they take by not supporting the reform process. This means, in our view at Eurasia Group, that the anti-corruption drive is actually going to get more intense in 2016, which is only going to add to the sense that the rest of us have. As we look at China and we try to understand what's going on there, there's going to be an even greater sense for the rest of us that there's a lot going on in that country that we don't understand. So that's China as a source of volatility. Again, the actual risk, our view, is overrated. We think China's growth is probably pretty strong. One, one last word on China. Um, you know, one of the things that came out of the WikiLeaks scandal was they caught the Chinese premier at the time on tape saying in an off-the-record meeting in response to a question about Chinese GDP, no, you shouldn't believe our GDP figures. I don't believe them. 6.9%, whatever. No, I look, at, I look at manufacturing data, I look at energy demand, I look at 100 different micro indicators of what's going on in the economy. I don't look at the headline figures. Well, so if Premier Lee doesn't, you know, maybe we shouldn't either. And, and we should also focus on the fact that, you know, a couple of years ago, China said, okay, the growth target is 7%. And then the next time there was a public utterance about the growth target, they said, the growth target is 7%-ish. 
And we're expecting at the People's Congress this year, they're going to say 6.5 to 7 percent. So you can see that even, you know, even with the questionable figures, they're widening out their room for maneuver here. But I, I've asked every single member of our China team at Eurasia Group, I said, let me give you a multiple choice question so that I can understand what's really going on in China. Multiple choice. A, Chinese statistics are generally more accurate than people give them credit for. B, the statistics are off. They're not, they're not close to being accurate. But it's OK. The leadership knows what the real numbers are. Or C, as in the case of the Soviet Union in 1984, 1985, the numbers are phony, and even the leadership doesn't know the true state of the economy. The good news is every single member of our China team I, who I've asked independently, so they're not influenced by one another's answer, their answer is B. The Chinese leadership does know basically what's going on in the Chinese economy. And they have the ability, if they need to stimulate, to stimulate the economy. They don't want to, because part of the reform process involves allowing the economy to slow down. Um, so there is less to the fear than meets the eye, but the fear and the volatility are going to continue. So moving to Europe. The obvious place to start when you talk about Europe is to say 1.8 million migrants entered Europe in 2015. 1.1 million of those 1.8 are in Germany. And our view is that you might very well have even bigger numbers this year. Syria is not getting better, no matter what President Putin says about Russia's role in Syria. Syria's not getting better, it's getting worse. The other issue is beyond the question of what's going on in Syria, is the fact that if you live in Syria or if you live anywhere in the Middle East or in North Africa or in East Africa, in Eritrea or Somalia, or you live in Afghanistan, and you think there's any possibility at all that your family has a future in Europe, you're going to go now. There's a lot of people who are thinking, now is the time to go. Because if you don't go now, Europe is going to close the door. This is why, despite all the predictions that in the cold weather that the migrant flows would slow down, they have not slowed down meaningfully. Migrant flows this winter, despite the bad weather, are much higher than they were this time last year. So imagine what we're talking about in the spring. Now. Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, is the key to this whole situation. Angela Merkel, for a lot of different reasons, has taken an extraordinary political gamble. She is the one leader in Europe that says, we will set no limit on the number of migrants that we are willing to accept. They have to accept, they have to, they have to qualify under our asylum program. We're not going to give a place in German society to people who are really more economic migrants than refugees. But we refuse to set a limit. 1.1 million last year. Now, some of this is self-interest. Some of it is probably humanitarian, genuine humanitarian empathy for these people. Some of it is economic self-interest, because the demographics in Germany are very bad. Germany needs immigrant labor in order to maintain its growth rates into the indefinite future. And accepting refugees is an economic stimulus, because you have to spend the money in the construction sector, in the housing sector, on infrastructure to incorporate all these people. There are other reasons why you take refugees. But the risk is clear. On New Year's Eve, as I'm sure almost everybody in this room is aware, on New Year's Eve in cities across Germany, most particularly in Cologne, there were very ugly news stories in which literally hundreds of German women filed police complaints about various forms of assault that were committed on them by men who fit the description of being Muslims or just generally from the Middle East. Are some of these people migrants, refugees? I personally, I don't know. From a political standpoint, it doesn't matter. Angela Merkel's approval rating 
was already on the downswing. It is now lower than at any time in more than four years. Angela Merkel, who was very recently the most popular leader in Europe, has an approval rating of 37% now. There was a story a couple of weeks ago, and this is an example of just how tense it is in Europe at the moment. So there is a 13-year-old girl who is the daughter of a Russian immigrant family living in Berlin. She and her family are Russian speakers. They are ethnic Russians. They live in Berlin. 13-year-old girl goes missing. She turns up 24 hours later. A member of her family goes to the media and says, our, our girl, our, this girl, a member of our family, our daughter, our niece, was kidnapped by refugees and assaulted. So in the first 24 hours, it was a local news story. And then the Russian media got hold of it. And the Russian media ate this story up. 90% of Russians get their news from Russian state on television. The people who get their news on the internet in Russia, the three most visited websites for news in Russia are all dominated by the state. And the state narrative was, this girl was assaulted by refugees and the German government is covering it up. The Russian foreign minister held a press conference in which he said, clearly this girl was abducted, she was assaulted, and the German government is covering it up. And the German, finance, the German foreign minister said, we don't need Russia interfering in our affairs. Mind your own business. This is typical Russian propaganda. You have the Russian foreign minister and the German foreign minister engaged at the highest levels in an international fight. So what happened to that 13-year-old girl? She went to school. She got in a fight. She got a little bruised up in a fight. She was afraid to go home because her parents would punish her for fighting at school. She went to a friend's house and spent the night. German police know this because they tracked her cell phone. Made the whole story up. Goes home the next day, and now the, the police have said, you know, we know the whole story. The story is already out there. So a story that small, because there is so much tension equating refugees and terrorism and street crime and all kinds of things, Europe is so on a, a hair trigger at the moment, particularly Germany, that a story that is really nothing more than a family drama could turn into an international incident. That's how tense it is. Basically, what's happening here is in Germany, Angela Merkel has taken an approach that is designed to preserve the idea, some might say the illusion, of consensus in Europe. So when the Hungarian prime minister or the Slovak prime minister says, we don't care what you agree at the European level. We don't care about your majority vote. We're not letting any migrants in. Angela Merkel can say, it's OK. It's fine. They're coming to Germany. We'll work this out. We'll work through this. This is not a threat to the Schengen Agreement. This is not a threat to the free movement across borders. And Angela Merkel so far has been able to do more so that other countries can do less. But there have been similar incidents to the ones I described in Germany happening in Sweden. Sweden has actually taken more migrants per capita than any other European country. So earlier this year, another story from just this year, Sweden announces the imposition of temporary border controls on its border with Denmark. We're having trouble processing all the migrants. Temporary border controls with Denmark. We'll lift the border controls when the emergency has passed. Within 24 hours, the government of Denmark says, and therefore we impose temporary border controls on our border with Germany because we cannot afford to have refugees passing through our territory on their way to Sweden, become trapped in Denmark, and become our problem. So now we have temporary border controls. But don't worry, this is not a threat to Schengen. We'll lift the border controls as soon as the emergency is over. And the risk that we're watching very closely this year that it has an impact on the investment environment, on the business climate in Europe, on the European economy more broadly, is you could have a cascade of temporary border controls in response to who knows what, in country after country after country, and they say, well, we'll lift the border controls as soon as the emergency is over. Well, when is the emergency over? When Syria is a democracy, and when people think that living in Afghanistan is as good as living in Sweden. So, now, add into this risk for Europe the fact that in June, the British are going to vote on whether they want to be part of the European Union. Talk about a complicating factor. 
So all things being equal, our view at Eurasia Group is that the British will hold their referendum on June 23rd or on June 30th, and they will vote to remain in the European Union. Our view is that the risk that Britain will vote to leave the European Union is 30%, all things being equal. But if you look at public polling of Britain on this referendum question, the big swings in the favor of the out vote, of the we want out of Europe vote, have happened in response to the height of the migrant crisis in October and the terrorist attack last fall in Paris. When those two things happened, the out vote had a huge quick surge. So of course Britain should stay in the European Union. And most of the people that we talked to, I was in London last week, most of the people that we talked to acknowledge that of course we need to stay in the European Union and most EU countries don't want the Brits to leave. But, but the simple reality is if David Cameron schedules the referendum for June 23rd or June 30th, we're going to have to watch every day to make sure that there is no incident, there is no attack, there isn't something that will quickly and dramatically change public opinion in Britain. That is a very real risk that would be a mistake to underestimate. And even if Britain ultimately votes to stay in the European Union, as we expect, the cost of hedging for this risk will be considerable in both Britain and in Europe. I hate to tell you, but Greece is probably coming back in the news too. So Europe has got a lot of problems. Now, one more factor before I move off Europe. Russia. We began this year by saying that Russia, that President Putin's foreign policy was probably going to be less unpredictable and more cooperative in 2016, certainly, than we've seen since the beginning of the crisis in Ukraine. That there would be fewer surprises. Why? Because Putin knows the oil price is not going to recover. Russia is a government where half of all government revenue comes from selling oil and gas. So they're living with the reality that lower for longer for them is a problem they're going to have to manage. So Putin wants the EU to at least ease, if not lift, the sanctions. That's why Ukraine has dropped out of the headlines. Ukraine has gone quiet because Putin has focused on ensuring that the fighting in Donetsk and Luhansk goes down, and Putin is arguing to European leaders that he will play a role in stabilizing Syria, which will slow the flow of migrants toward Europe, hopefully winning the approval of European leaders who will then gratefully begin to ease the sanctions. Well, it's very clear that's not happening. Russia's not stabilizing Syria. Sta Syria is becoming more unstable. The Russians are bombing Aleppo, which is a rebel stronghold. And even Angela Merkel said last weekend, we're getting more refugees now, not less. And so the idea of the Europeans easing sanctions on the Russians for the moment is off the table, probably for the first half of this year. And the risk is if we get to the second half of the year and Putin decides that he is not going to get sanctions relief, then his next ploy may be to think, well, if I can't bribe them into giving me sanctions relief, maybe I can blackmail them into giving me sanctions relief, which means that Ukraine makes it back into the news in the second half of this year, as if Europe didn't have enough problems. So that's Europe. <laughs> so. I'm going to move to the Middle East, but this is the point in the presentation where I take a small intermission and apologize for the fact that I'm making this sound like the end of the world. I mean, you know, this is the time of year when we're doing our top risk presentation. There are a lot of issues that I'm not talking about. There are a lot of good news stories out there, and there are actually a lot of opportunities even within the risks, which I'm happy to talk about more in the Q&A. I know this sounds dire, but the real issue is that we're living in an era of transition in international politics, where we, we used to have a system. At the end of the Cold War, we at least had the illusion that the G7 had the predominance of power in the world, that the, U the US and the Europeans could get together with financial support from the Japanese, and they could get the outcome they want. We can bring the Russians into the tent, call it the G8 to make sure they're inside the tent rather than outside the tent. That's good for everybody. And that illusion is long gone. Maybe the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan did it. Maybe it's the natural evolution of China's rise. But we're in a world in international politics where it's now painfully obvious that we're transitioning away from a world where we can count on predictable leadership from the US, from the Europeans, and we're transitioning to a system that we can't quite describe yet. 
But we do live in a world where we got more forest fires than we used to because the U.S. is stepping back. The Obama administration has made clear they're going to end wars. They're not going to start any new ones. The Europeans have so many problems to deal with. They're not interested in becoming more involved in the Middle East unless it's to deal with a terrorism risk or to slow the flow of migrants. And then the Chinese, the Chinese are much more involved in international affairs in the sense that they're, 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 they're extending their trade and investment influence. But the Chinese are not going to referee fights in the Middle East. They can't afford it. Too much cost, too much risk. So we have more wildfires than we used to. They burn hotter and longer than they used to. But this is not the end of the world. It's a period of transition. And you know, maybe what we're looking at right now is a level of volatility that is going to force some form of international cooperation that we can get to the other side of this. So with that caveat, let me move to the Middle East now. Our focus this year in the Middle East is really on Saudi Arabia. For years, we've treated Iran as the wild card in the region, and Iran is still a bit of a wild card in the region. But the Saudis, it's already done. The Saudis have become the wild card in the Middle East. There are four reasons why the Saudis are increasingly anxious about what's going on around them and becoming a more unpredictable actor. Number one, Brent is selling for $31 a barrel. And there are various estimates about what, what kind of oil price the Saudis need to balance their budget. But the guy who covers Saudi Arabia for us at Eurasia Group says the real number is probably about $90. The Saudis need $90 a barrel oil to balance their budget, and we're at 31 and the Saudis are very aware that we're not going to see $90 a barrel oil unless there's a real bolt from the blue, at least for the next couple of years. The Saudis still have more than $600 billion in reserves, but this time last year, they had more than $700 billion in reserves. They've already burned through $100 billion in a year. They're fine for 2016. This is not a good trajectory. Number two, regional rival, their major regional rival is Shia Iran. Iran is coming out from under sanctions. Iran is selling oil. There is a change in market share in global oil markets, which means there is a change in the balance of power in the Middle East, and it does not favor Saudi Arabia, and they know it. Number three, when the Saudis feel threatened, they turn to their friends. But in this case, their friends are saying, you know what, we're not really interested in helping you. They turn to their partners in the Gulf Cooperation Council. And a lot of these countries are much more interested in trying to figure out how to make money off Iran's revival than they are in trying to contain Iran behind Saudi leadership. So for example, at the beginning of this year, when the Saudis executed a Shia cleric and it went crazy in Tehran, and people in Iran stormed the Saudi embassy and trashed the place, the Saudis immediately said, we are cutting off our diplomatic relations with Iran. And Bahrain said, we are too. Bahrain is basically a province of Saudi Arabia. Sudan said, yes, we're also cutting off our relations with Iran. Sudan gets a huge portion of its budget from Saudi Arabia. But the United Arab Emirates said, we're not cutting off relations. Kuwait said, no, we're downgrading, but we're not cutting off relations. There is business to be done here. Let's not be hasty. And the Saudis realized they're trying to lead a, a, a Sunni force into battle, and there's no one behind them except Sudan and Bahrain. Nor are they going to turn to their old friends in Washington, DC. Because Obama administration aside, the US just does not need that oil the way we used to. And from Washington's standpoint, Although you're not going to see a, a major rapprochement between the US and Iran in the next few years, from Washington's standpoint, you look at the Middle East and what, is, what are you worried about in the Middle East? What's your number one risk? It's not about oil. It's ISIS or Sunni militancy more broadly. And if you're looking at ISIS as a long-term problem, the Saudis are not going to be your partner because the Saudis have been allowing money and weapons and people 
to go to ISIS for years in an effort to destabilize Iraq, to keep Iraq and Iran, the two Shia powers in the region, from working together. Your natural partner is not Saudi Arabia. Your natural partner is Iran. And the Saudis know it. The Saudis cannot count on Washington the way they used to. And again, it doesn't matter that much who the next president is, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. Interests in the region have changed. There is a fourth factor. Beyond the oil price, beyond the rise of Iran, beyond the fact that Saudi has very few friends it can count on, the fourth factor is, for the first time in decades, we now stand on the verge of actual generational change in the Saudi leadership. They have run out of brothers and half-brothers. The next king is going to come from a younger generation. We don't know whether younger generation means 60 years old or, in the case of the current deputy crown prince, 30 years old but we're finally going to see it skip a generation of power in Saudi Arabia. The current King Salman is elderly. He is not in good health. He could die tonight. He could die three years from now. We don't know. He wants his son to replace him. The problem for him is that his son, Mohammed bin Salman, is only 30 years old, which in the context of Saudi politics makes him a toddler. He's 30. These guys are all in their 70s. And so Mohammed bin Salman is too young to be named crown prince. So he's been named deputy crown prince. And he's been made the foreign minister. And he has been given great responsibility for domestic economic reform in Saudi Arabia. And he's 30 years old. And there are a lot of people in the Saudi royal family who really don't like this. He's being very aggressive, prosecuting a war in Yemen. He's more aggressive in Syria. He's more aggressive in Iraq. And this 30-year-old guy is the guy who's giving interviews with The Economist magazine talking about selling shares in Saudi Aramco, which was unthinkable even a year ago, reducing subsidies, doing things that Saudis don't talk about. And there are a lot of people in the family who are not happy about it. So the risk is... If the current King Salman dies sooner rather than later, before his son has done whatever it takes to form alliances within the family, to bolster his case, and to allow the king to lift him from deputy crown prince up to crown prince, if it happens before, then you could see open conflict within the Saudi royal family between supporters of the current crown prince, Mohammed bin Nayef, and supporters of the deputy crown prince. This doesn't happen. Saudi Arabia and China are places where when there is division within the elite, they keep it behind closed doors. And this is exactly the kind of fight that might be hard to keep behind closed doors. So you add up a low oil price that's a third of what they want it to be, and the rise of Iran, and the loss of their friends, and generational change in the leadership, and the Saudis have a lot to be nervous about, which means that Proxy conflict in Yemen, in Syria, in Iraq, interference in Lebanese politics, a lot of the other issues that are creating turmoil in the Middle East and creating more migrants heading toward Europe are going to intensify. So in a moment, we're getting low on time here. Um, in a moment, I'm going to take your question so you can start to think about things. And, and you know, there's so many subjects I haven't talked about, which you know, I'm happy to take on other subjects. But I want to say a more serious word about where we are in the U.S. presidential election. So um, I started at Eurasia Group in 2004. And since 2006, I have had the job of explaining U.S. elections to our non-American clients. It is absolutely the funnest part of my job. You know, and, and they ask great questions that you have to stop and think, you know, well, what is the difference between a caucus and a primary? You know what, let me call you back. I mean, I kind of know. Um, I was in Tokyo meeting with some of our Japanese clients like three weeks ago, and I was doing a presentation like this in Around the World, and I would talk about, I talked about Putin and Erdogan and Merkel and David Cameron and Barack Obama and all these names, and the one name that I mentioned where all the Japanese clients pick up their pens and wait to write down notes is Donald Trump. 
not kidding. They are, they are, and and I, every single meeting I was in there, I, was, I did 23 meetings in five days, there was at least one Trump question in every meeting I did. I was even getting Michael Bloomberg questions. So this is what I think about where we are in terms of the election. Um, all credit to Bernie Sanders. He's run an amazing campaign. He's not going to be the Democratic nominee. You know, we've been saying all along, okay, Sanders is going to win in New Hampshire. Hillary Clinton is going to be the Democratic Party's nominee for president unless she is struck by lightning, has a heart attack, or is indicted. The third one is more likely than the first two, but we don't see any of those things happen. Okay, it's as simple as this. On March the 1st, after the South Carolina primary, on March the 1st, you're gonna have primary elections right here in Georgia, in Texas, in Alabama, in Arkansas, in Tennessee, in Virginia, and we'll see where Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton are in the delegate count after that. And I think the media is going to be telling a different story about the Clinton campaign. So let's start by saying, you know, we are very confident Hillary Clinton is going to be the Democratic nominee. Now, Republicans. I used to say, I said six months ago in answer to questions that my, my personal opinion of the odds of Donald Trump winning the Republican nomination were 5 to 10 percent. Today, I would say it's like 25 to 30 percent. You can't ignore the fact that he's been leading the polls for seven months. Not just national polls, but polling of key states. He spent very little of his own money. He doesn't need to buy the publicity. The media comes to him. Traditional media is getting destroyed by the internet and social media, and it's a two-year campaign. They need ratings. Donald Trump was born to play this role. So the media comes to Donald Trump, and Donald Trump is with the exception of Ronald Reagan, there has never been a candidate who is more comfortable on camera than Donald Trump. This TV experience or whatever it is. He is a serious contender. He is going to win delegates. Even if he doesn't win the nomination, he's going to have delegates in his pocket next July, and he's going to want stuff for those delegates. Number two, Ted Cruz. The primary process sets up very nicely for Ted Cruz. If you think about the states that I just named that are voting on March 1st, Georgia, Texas, Alabama, Tennessee, Arkansas, Virginia, those are very good states for Ted Cruz, and they're not great states for Marco Rubio. Leaving aside what happened to Marco Rubio in the debate last weekend, he's, gonna, he's the third candidate. He is going to be around for a while. He is a strong candidate. There's a lot of money behind him. There are a lot of people who feel that he is the best position candidate to defeat Hillary Clinton. So between Trump and Cruz and Marco Rubio, your nominee is probably going to come from one of those three. I saw what John Kasich did last night. Okay, he won 16% of Republicans slash independents in New Hampshire. That's great. Again, Georgia, Texas, Alabama, Arkansas, Tennessee, Virginia. John Kasich would be an ideal vice presidential candidate for Marco Rubio if Rubio could talk him into it. Um, and there will be a lot of people, you know, as we always say, there will be a lot of people, if you got a Rubio Kasich ticket, that would say, I sure do wish we could flip this, you know, but I think that's the more likely outcome. Now, I don't think Trump can beat Hillary Clinton. I don't think Ted Cruz can beat Hillary Clinton. I think Rubio, despite the fact that he's 44 years old, has very little national experience, really, really, really laid an egg last weekend, I think that would be a really interesting race, especially with John Kasich. If you can imagine, Cruz from Florida, Kasich from Ohio, you know, there's a lot going on there. So that's an interesting possibility. I don't believe that Michael Bloomberg will run for president unless he feels he has a credible chance to win. He's not going to do a vanity candidacy. I, you know, as somebody that watched this guy be mayor three terms, he's just not going to do that. And he's not going to run, he's not going to believe that he has a credible path if, as we believe, Hillary Clinton is the Democratic nominee. I think that Bloomberg is talking about running for two reasons. One, if it were Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, then he might run. Two, he's doing what a lot of people do. He's trying to draw attention to the issues that he cares about. And he knows the best way to do that is to say, you know, I'm thinking about running for president. And the media will all come in. How many votes is he going to get? No one right of center is going to vote for Bloomberg because Bloomberg is a crazy-eyed liberal, you know, in, in a lot of Republican standards, as mayor of New York. And there's not that many people who are going to vote for him on the left-hand side because I think they want to win the election. So he could be a factor, but I ultimately don't think he's going to run. The real wild card is if Trump decides that he's having too much fun to quit in July and he's not the nominee. 
No way to forecast that. If Donald Trump, and, and the threat will be there, he'll be coy about it. If he's not the nominee, if Cruz has the delegates, or Rubio has the delegates, or maybe John Kasich, Trump will be coy in answer to the question about whether he's going to stick it out and come back and try to do a Ross Perot right up to the very end. So we're all going to be dealing with the Donald Trump wild card for a long time. And if Donald Trump were to run for a third party candidate, an independent candidacy, then Hillary Clinton will be the next president. So that's a lot of ground. Thank you for listening to all of that. It's a lot.